Good evening. Good evening. This is the last evening of our closed class in Holland, 1960. And first of all, please let me thank all of you for this opportunity of sharing this message and also thank so many of you for your thoughtfulness to us and to our students from England and Canada and the United States who are on this spiritual safari with us. It is one of the most beautiful experiences in the infinite way to travel in all parts of the world and to note how our students are traveling from one country to another and meeting the students in different countries and really fulfilling not only the spiritual function of loving thy neighbor as thyself but what is very important learning to know the people of all countries and to know that underneath we are all one regardless of all the differences that we have in language and appearance and customs and habits and all of this is part of bringing about a more universal understanding of each other Also, it is especially gratifying to notice how Infinite Way students understand each other and how they love each other as they meet in many parts of the world. And so, this part of our work for these many years has been a most gratifying experience. It is possible that there will be no trip to Holland next year. You see, we have been on this trip since last July and we don't finish for another five months. And uh, in that length of time, we have completed, will have completed two missions. When I was sent home from Holland, the year before last, I was told to wait there for a specific message that was to be taken to the students. And I returned to, to uh, my home, canceled all of my remaining work, and was given a message that I was told to take to the students for nine months. And that message is the message that is found in all of the 1959 tapes. Now, of course, I realize that no student has had opportunity of sufficiently studying the 1959 work to really know what it is about. Even those, and of course, I do know that there are some who have heard all of the 1959 tapes and some who have heard them three and four and five times. But I'm sure that they don't even begin to suspect what is on that message yet because it goes so far beyond anything that has ever come into their metaphysical or spiritual experience that on the first hearing of it or the second or the third they would hardly recognize the nature of the message or its depth. But I was told to give it for nine months and then follow up with this message on transcendental consciousness. And ever since February in uh, Los Angeles, I have been on this second part of the message. And you will find all of it embodied in the 1960 tapes, Los Angeles, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Grand Rapids, 
Michigan, London, London, a tremendous message <coughs> a couple of weeks ago, last week in fact, and now this message here in The Hague, which I am sure that as time goes on you will begin to recognize its nature, and then whatever comes the balance of this year, and that will complete the work that was given me to do during this 17-month period. We have traveled, we have given classes and lectures almost every single day or night, and conducted the healing work, <coughs> brought out the monthly letters, and a lot of new books some of which are in publication now. You will have here from England uh, this month, July, The Art of Spiritual Healing. And uh, next year you will have a new book which is being published in New York in uh, March and will probably be published in England by September or October. And. Uh, So you can see that for this past year and for the next few months that the time has been so thoroughly occupied that there is enough work for the students to do even to catch up with that so that I may have the opportunity of staying home next year or fulfilling some other activity as may be given. And so this is a good time tell you that all of this work of the infinite way which had its beginning in 1945 when I was told that next year 1946 will be your year of transition. I thought because we use the word transition in spiritual language I thought that this meant passing on or dying, but the voice assured me that it did not mean dying or passing on, it meant a transition into a higher state of consciousness. And so it was that in 1946 an experience took place that lasted two whole months. It was an experience similar to what many of you may have read in books, an initiation, a teaching that continued for a period of two months and then I was told to start this new work and given instructions in how to begin. Now from that day up to this very minute, everything that I have done has been under guidance. I have been given instruction from within. I have done none of this myself. None of the message that you read in my books or that you hear on tapes is mine. I never knew those things. I had no way of knowing them because many of these principles have never appeared in the, the language of our day. Some have never been in print in the history of the world, so it would have been impossible for me of my own self to know them. And so day by day, week by week, I have received instruction on the inner plane. I have even been given instruction in how to carry it out to the world and even when. I have, ex have had experiences like sitting at my desk and being told in plain words, go to London, go to New York. Almost every session of every class 
either the night before or early of the morning or else sometimes sitting giving the class all of a sudden these messages are given to me they're really not mine they're things that I haven't known they are things that are imparted to me and very often I don't know them any sooner than the students do in other words I am being taught them at the same time that I am voicing them this has happened many 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 times probably uh, among the most outstanding examples of that was in my very first closed class in San Francisco the one that you have read as metaphysical notes when almost I think you'll find it on the first page the words came through my lips my conscious oneness with God constitutes my oneness with all spiritual being and idea and up to that moment I had never heard that or known it and uh, you will find this that with the exception of one mystical teaching of which I now have knowledge this has never been taught as a principle of life in other words it is another way of explaining what the master meant when he said take no thought for your life what you shall eat what you shall drink wherewithal you shall be clothed seek ye the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you and in this sentence that I have just quoted to you my conscious oneness with God constitutes my oneness with all spiritual being an idea you have actually the full teaching of the master statement and as I have proven since this is actually the secret of all spiritual living this is the secret of prayer no one should ever pray for anything no one should ever pray for supply for health for home for companionship for safety or security or even for peace because they are not to be had except by first <coughs> making contact with God oh yes humanly we have periods between wars if you call that peace humanly a person can make a fortune and sometimes be lucky enough to keep it throughout all their lives and most often lose it at some period in their experience or have it taken from them but spiritually there is no way to attain good on earth except by making conscious contact with God conscious oneness with God therefore if an individual were to forget their supply their health their home their safety their security and devote their entire time to seeking the realization of God they would then discover that they would have an abundance of supply they would have home they would have ideal companionships friendships marriage whatever it might mean all good would unfold without once uttering a prayer for anything and even in the midst of war they would find safety and security even though a thousand fell at their left and ten thousand at their right it would not come nigh their dwelling place if they made their conscious contact with God and that from the very first close class has been a major theme of all of the messages of the infinite way and it was taught to me in that moment 
on the, in the first session of the first closed class. In the same way, for many years, students would ask me about the Sermon on the Mount. Now, since I never teach anything that hasn't been given to me in Revelation, I would always answer, I cannot answer you because I know nothing about the Sermon on the Mount except the words that are in the Bible and I don't know what they mean. Nor have I ever read anything that anyone has written on the Sermon on the Mount that I believe, that sounds real to me or logical. And therefore, I can't answer you and until I have a revelation, I will never speak to you about any part of the Bible. 1956, I was sitting on the platform giving a class when all of a sudden the voice spoke to me and said, give the Sermon on the Mount. And I turned and answered the voice and said, I don't know the Sermon on the Mount. And the voice said again, Sermon on the Mount. And I said, I don't know the Sermon on the Mount. And the third time the voice said, open your Bible to the fifth chapter of Matthew. And I opened the Bible to the fifth chapter of Matthew, and as if it were in electric lights, I saw the whole secret of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, from that class on, in fact, every class in 1956 contains the secret of the Sermon on the Mount. And incidentally, that will be one half of my book that will be published in 1961. You see, I've had to wait five years for the students to get used to the idea of the Sermon on the Mount before it could be released to the world. Very often I have been told, when given a truth, wait a year, wait two years. You will notice the wisdoms in the new edition of The Infinite Way. Those wisdoms were given to me over a period of two years. And then I was told to give them to 12 students. And they had them for two years. And then I was told that they could be published. And as you read those wisdoms, you'll find out why. And you'll begin to perceive that ordinarily a human being without a background could never understand or believe that message. So it is then that whatever has been given to us under the name of the infinite way, whether in our books or in our tapes or in our monthly letters, all of it has been given to me under inspiration from within. And uh, on the whole, wherever it has been given the opportunity, these principles have proven themselves to be practical. They don't sound practical when you read them in a book. They don't seem practical when you weigh them against your human knowledge. That is why it was several years before any large publishing house would accept them because they seemed very dreamy, very impractical. But now that they are proving their practicality, publishers all over the world are asking for them. And as a matter of fact, there will be a Japanese translation in October of The Art of Meditation. So these books are going around the world. Now, if you stop to think of the message in that light, you will then know why there is no wisdom in my giving more classes when the students have had no opportunity yet of understanding the work of 1956, this new work of 1959, and this work of 1960, I'm sure will take years before the students even begin to understand the meaning behind it. And so it is that having given this 1959 and 1960 work 
And by the time we finish this trip, if we're permitted to finish it, it will have been 17 months. It may well be that next year the Father will have something entirely different in mind for me, and we will see. Now, because this is our last evening here, at least for a while, let me bring to your conscious awareness a few points that it would be well for you to know, more especially points that are unique in the message of the infinite way, and which, if you hope to demonstrate this message, you will have to know. In knowing, you will have to forget much of what you have heretofore been taught in your metaphysical studies. Incidentally, that is what makes the infinite way difficult. You can't combine it with any other metaphysical message, and you have to specifically drop some of the very principles with which you have heretofore worked. Of course, you won't drop any that you are finding very successful, but there are many principles which you may believe you are not demonstrating and others are. But if you could investigate, you would find out that you are not demonstrating them because they are not demonstrable. And yet, not knowing this, you may have stuck with them. Now, let me illustrate for a moment. The infinite way is the only metaphysical teaching which reveals that all evil, sin or disease, lack or limitation, is impersonal, meaning the error is not within you. The error does not have to be uncovered within you. The error does not have its rise within you, even if you may be the victim of it. In other words, it never has been true that resentment caused rheumatism or that hate or jealousy caused cancer. It never has been true that there is a mental cause for, I mean a specific mental cause for a physical disease. Now, every metaphysical teaching has as one of its foundation points that there is some error or wrong thinking in you which must be corrected or changed or overcome. All of them have some lists showing how resentment causes rheumatism, how hate causes cancer, and uh, oh, lists and lists of these things. And the very first attempt is made to find out what is the error in your thinking. Now, the infinite way reverses this and says that not one word of this is true or ever was true. The truth is that all evil has its rise in an impersonal source which ancient days they called the devil or Satan. Later Paul called it the carnal mind. Later Mrs. Eddy called it mortal mind. But in any event all evil has its rise in this impersonal source and must be recognized as such in order to bring about spiritual healing. In other words, there is a mental healing and it's used in psychosomatic medicine, in psychology, in psychiatry, and in all of the mental sciences. All of these are based on the fact 
that the error is within you. And if the practitioner can just dig out the root of the error in you, you can be cured. That is why in uh, uh, psychoanalysis, they keep examining you for days, weeks, months, or years until they find what the basic evil was. Now, as a matter of fact, they never do find it, and they never do cure it. At a meeting recently in New York of psychoanalysts, they acknowledge that they have never healed anyone, and they have acknowledged that their principle is wrong and that they must seek a new principle of operation. We could have told them that years and years and years ago because it is basic in the infinite way that evil has its foundation in an impersonal source. Now, this impersonal source whether you call it devil or carnal mind or mortal mind, since it is not ordained of God, it has no power. And herein lies your ability to heal. Once you can separate the error from the person and place it out here in, let's call it carnal mind, and then realize that God never made a carnal mind, God never made anything detrimental to his own creation. God never ordained anything to be destructive to his creation. Therefore, the carnal mind is not of God, has no law of God, and is the arm of flesh or nothingness. Then you'll find why it is that you need not pray to God to raise Lazarus from the tomb. You need not pray to God to raise Jesus from the tomb. You need not pray to God to heal your patient or your student or your child or your parent. What you must do is know the truth. And when you know the truth, that this error, regardless of its name or nature, is not personal, has nothing to do with your patient, but is really an activity of the carnal mind which, not being God-ordained or God-sustained, exists only as a mirage, you are then doing spiritual healing work by knowing the truth. Now, you will be surprised when you put this into practice to find that it doesn't only heal good people, it heals sinners. It not only heals them, it heals them of their sins. Because whereas uh, we have been condemning the woman taken in adultery, or we have been condemning the thieves and the tyrants, now knowing that the sin is not theirs or of them, we say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. This is impersonal. And the guilt is removed from their shoulders and they have the opportunity to be healed. The moment you know that some sin of omission or commission in your life was really not your doing, and that you were not responsible for it, that it had its rise in this outer temptation, you likewise learn how to forgive yourself, even 70 times 7. And the moment you learn to forgive yourself, you've lifted the burden of guilt from your own shoulders and you've enabled yourself to come out and be healthy. Whereas the longer you keep condemning yourself for sins of the past, whether they were serious ones or minor ones, whether they were as serious as murder or as mild as just being unkind to somebody, once you begin to realize that this was never your nature, for your nature is derived from God, for you are the child of God, 
this was an imposed thing, a temptation from outside, and now you recognize that you're free of it. It is like the master facing the devil, being tempted, but because he knew that this wasn't his thought, that this was only an imposed temptation, he could say, get thee behind me, Satan. Those are not my thoughts. Those are not my qualities. That is not my nature. And I refuse to accept the temptation from outside my own being. And so it is. Every wrong that we have ever done is the result of a temptation from this impersonal source of evil. Now, it has been left to the infinite way to reveal to the world the source of all evil. You could ask ministers, rabbis, priests of any denomination the source of evil and you would get the answer that this is not known. And up until this message of the infinite way, it has not been known how evil originated and how it is perpetuated and how it may be overcome. And in the days to come, it will be this revelation which you will prove first in your individual experience and then in a wider circle until you will see how it embraces the world. So you will learn that every bit of evil that has ever touched you in your life has come from a universal belief with which you had nothing to do. A universal belief that there are two powers, good and evil. In other words, you have to go all the way back to Adam and Eve to find this principle and then you can't find it in the Bible because the church has covered it up by telling you that Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden because of a sex act. And this was nonsense of the first water. When you are able to read the book of Genesis, separate and apart from the hypnotism that the church has placed on you, you will read in very clear language that they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden course of the belief in good and evil. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you see, knowledge comes not through the body but through the mind. So it wasn't an act of the body that threw them out of the Garden of Eden. It was their acceptance in the mind of two powers, good and evil. And you can prove it by beginning at any moment that you wish and accepting the fact that God is omnipotence. That's all you have to do. Begin to accept that God is omnipotence. Now, I don't mean accept it by saying, oh yes, I read that in my books. Oh yes, the Bible says God is almighty. I don't mean that kind of acceptance. That's lip service. I mean, sit down quietly and ask yourself very seriously, can there really be a God of omnipotence? And can there be power in anything else but God? <coughs> what does the word omnipotence mean? Does it mean all power or does it mean all power and some other power besides? Does it mean God, which is spirit, is all power and matter is power, infection is power, contagion is power? And then you will realize slowly that infection and contagion, matter, these are only power in the consciousness of an individual who is living the human life, which means accepting two powers. Now, as long as you are a human being under the regular 
belief of the human world, you will find that there are not only two powers, there are many powers in your life. There is not only the power of matter, there's the power of mind. You can be manipulated mentally without your knowing it. And you can be handled by material laws, physical laws germ theories. But watch the miracle. Once you accept God as omnipotence and then sit by with a case of somebody who has an infection or a contagion, a germ disease, and you sit by and don't pray to God to heal it, leave God alone. He's taking care of his own work. You begin to know the truth that God is omnipotence. And this law of matter or law of mind, since it is not of God, since it is not a part of omnipotent good, it is not a power. And then watch how you cure these colds and grip and flu and fever and inflammation and one thing and another, proving not that God did you a favor by healing your patient or friend, because God doesn't do anybody any favors. What God does is from everlasting to everlasting, and what God does is equally for everybody, whether they're saint or sinner. There's no such thing as God doing anything for anybody, except what God does for everybody. And God operates through law, and when God has a law that two times two are four, you just make up your mind that two times two are four for everybody in every country on the globe. And if God has a law that H2O is water, you can be assured that in any language, in any country, in any religion, H2O is water. And if God has a law of aerodynamics, you can be assured that whether the airplane is made in the United States or England or Holland or Germany, if they use the law of aerodynamics, the plane will fly. Why? Because God is no respecter of persons, and God does nothing for one person that isn't a universal truth. And that truth is the same for saints and for sinners, and it is the same for white and for black and for Jew and for Gentile. In the kingdom of God there is neither Greek nor Jew, neither bond nor slave, and his reign falls on the just and the unjust. So a law of God is eternal. And if a metaphysician can heal a cold or grip or flu or fever, then you can be assured of this, anybody can be healed of it. Because God doesn't care whether you're a metaphysician or if you have no religion. The only one thing that's necessary is ye shall know the truth. And the truth you have to know is that God is spirit, and spirit is omnipotence. And if spirit is omnipotence, there is no power in any material or mental law or belief, because all of these so-called laws aren't really laws, they're beliefs. If they were laws, they could never be cured. You see, this is basic too. There is no such thing as a law of disease. If that sounds strange to you, just remember this. Everything that has a law is eternal. <coughs> Everything that has a law is permanent. In other words, mathematics is never changing. Two times two are always four because it's a law. H2O is water because it's a law. The laws of aeroplaning, the laws of automobiling, these are laws. And because they're laws, they can never be broken. Nobody can ever break a law. Now, theories and beliefs, that's quite different. When you go to a medical authority, and say, are all the medical laws of 20 years ago still recognized as laws? 
that will laugh at you. There's almost nothing that was believed 20 years ago in medicine that is still believed today. Why? Because we've discovered how wrong they were 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So they weren't laws, they were beliefs or theories. And so we have beliefs and theories today. Whatever is law is permanent. Now, if a disease had a law, you couldn't cure it because the law would sustain it forever and forever. For instance, whenever you plant rose seeds, you will eventually get roses. Why? There is a law of like begetting like. Now try to break that law and see if you can, or if anybody ever has in all the thousands of years of history, see if anybody ever brought forth a banana from a rose bush. You cannot break a law. And so if disease had a law, you could never cure a disease because the law would make it permanent. The mere fact that it can be broken shows that it wasn't a law, it had no law to sustain it. Whatever it had, you were able to change. And so you will find that it is possible to heal disease physically, medically, surgically, because we are operating on the level of human belief. And as a rule, as you believe, so will it be unto you. But to come to a permanent harmony, you can only do this through law. And the only law there is is spiritual law. And the reason is God is spirit and God is the only lawgiver, therefore spirit is the only law. And if a thing isn't sustained by spiritual law, it can be met, it can be changed, it can be corrected. And the way of it is the word omnipotence. Once you believe that spirit alone is full and complete law, and do not make exceptions, don't say in one breath, God is law, and then we must protect ourselves from the Russians or the Catholics or the Orientals or something else. Don't say God is omnipotence and then say, oh, we have nothing to fear but sin. Don't say God is omnipotence, but you must read so many pages of my book. That's not making God omnipotence. If God is omnipotence, then God is omnipotence if you never read a book. It isn't the reading of the book. It isn't the reading of all the infinite way books or, or hearing all the infinite way tapes. It is learning what principles they teach and then embodying them up here because in the book they won't heal. In the book they won't change your life. But accept it in your consciousness, they will. And as you begin to understand omnipotence, you will begin to lose your fear of persons. Cease ye for man whose breath is in his nostril, for where is he to be accounted of? Put not your faith in princes. You will learn that your full and complete reliance is on spirit. Now, the infinite way carries you another step. And it tells you that this spirit and this power is not in a God somewhere. It is in the God that is within you. Therefore, all power is within you. And therefore, the infinite way gives you this. There is no power external to you that can operate on you for good or for evil. There is no power in heaven or on earth that can work on you or in you for good or for evil. The only power there is is the power of that flows out from you because the kingdom of God is within you. And if the kingdom of God is within you, then it's from the kingdom of God that the power must flow. 
And the very moment you begin to accept this, you begin to lose your fear of weather, of climate, of uh, enemies in this country or that country. You begin to lose your fear of whether the country has a depression or whether it's going to have a boom. You begin to lose your fear of any kind of physical laws, mental laws, legal laws. You begin to understand, I am the law. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I and my Father are one. And the Father has given me his dominion. His dominion operates in me and through me and out from me. Power does not act on me, it flows out from me. And as I learn to pray that secretly and sacredly, never voicing it openly or outwardly, keeping it locked up within me, very soon that silent power begins to flow out from within me and becomes noticeable in my own life and in the life of all those who touch me. Now, the infinite way has made a statement which shocks people wherever it's heard in the world, but unless you understand it, you will find that you cannot really make your demonstration of harmony, not permanently. There is no God in the human world, and human beings don't have a God. That is the reason that people can pray in all the churches all around the world and sin, disease, and death goes on right away. You've been reading today, haven't you, in the paper about all these crimes that are going on in the Congo, all these innocent women that have been wrecked down there. Where do you think God was if God was in the human scene? Why didn't God protect these innocent women? Good women, nice women, just as nice as you are. Why didn't God protect them? And the answer is there is no God in the human scene. If we want God in our experience, we have got to rise above the human scene and make contact with God. Seek ye the kingdom of God live and move and have your being in God, dwell in the secret place of the Most High, abide in the Word and let the Word abide in you, then none of these things will come nigh your dwelling place. But remember, <clears throat> your consciousness is the secret of life, and what does not take place in your consciousness does not take place in your life. And Therefore, if you do not open your consciousness to pray without ceasing. If you do not open your consciousness every day, hours every day, to realize omnipresence and omnipotence, omnipresence, where I am, God is. The place whereon I stand is holy ground. Unless you do that, you will be separate and apart from God. And now I want to give you your final instruction. First, I will give you three words. Omnipotence, by which you are to accept that God, Spirit, is the only power, and that there is no power in climate or weather or infection or germs or bullets or bombs or tyrants. In other words, there is no power in the human mind and its beliefs. You can sum it all up that way. Since God is spirit, the mind of God, the consciousness of God is the only power, and the mind of man is not power, nor his theories, nor his beliefs, nor his laws. And then the second word, omnipresence. Here where I am is the presence of God. 
The place whereon I stand is holy ground. Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I mount up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. If I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art there. So therefore, wherever I am, God is. And my conscious remembrance of this is my protection from the evils of this world. Because in the presence of God there is liberty. In the presence of God there is fulfillment. But God is only present where God is consciously realized. Never forget that statement. God is only present where God is consciously realized. We brought that out right from the start, that if there is love in this room, we brought it here in our consciousness. If we hadn't brought it here, it wouldn't be here. Only that is in this room which we brought. And if we brought God, no evil can come nigh the dwelling place of anybody in this room. Because in God's presence there is fulfillment of good. There is omnipotence and omnipresence. And the third word is omniscience. meaning all wisdom, all knowledge. Now remember that right where you are is all wisdom, all knowledge, because God is there. And so it is that if you want to give a treatment, don't worry about how to give it, and don't go around looking in books how to give it. Turn within yourself and realize that because of omniscience, all wisdom, all knowledge, being omnipresence, you can find all the treatments you'll ever need for anything within you. Within you. Within you is the kingdom of God. And therefore, within you is omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience. And now, to set the seal on all of this, I will tell you that God in the midst of you has a name. And as long as you remember that name, you have God consciously with you. In ancient days when this was discovered, it was never permitted to use this name. The Hebrews were never allowed to use this name. Moses discovered it. But he only permitted it to be used by the priests when they were in the inner sanctuary. Jesus taught it to his disciples. And very few of them understood him or caught the meaning of it. The only one who seems to have caught the full realization of it is John. And that's why in the Gospel of John you have it most clearly stated. But because only mystics were able to understand it, the church has never been able to accept it. And so it is never taught in church. It is never taught in a church religion. But it is to be found in the mystical teachings of the world. And when a mystic discovers it, he usually keeps it secret within himself, knowing that if he gave it out to the world, he would be laughed at, ridiculed, and maybe hung, crucified as the master was because he taught it. God is closer to you than breathing. There is nothing closer to you than breathing than yourself. Only you are closer to yourself than your breathing. And so the self of you is that which you call I. I am me. I am myself. I is my name, my identity. And therefore, as long as you can Keep your lips closed so that even those who
can lip read, can't read it. As long as you can keep it secret, remembering the word I, I in the midst of me, this will be your salvation. This will be your safety and your security. This will be your omnipresence, omnipotence, and omniscience, the remembrance of the word I. For the name of God is I. I am that I am. I am. I within me. The I of my being is itself the Son of God, one with God. Not separate and apart from God, but one with God. Therefore thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me, for I and the Father are one. And all you have to do in any event, when faced with any temptation, sin, disease, death, lack, limitation, close your lips tightly and way down in here, remember I. The I in the midst of me is God. God is closer to me than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. And the only thing that's close to me is I. I myself. I am. And I am closer to me than breathing. I am within myself. I am. I and my Father are one. I in the midst of me is mighty. I am the bread and the meat and the wine and the water. I am the resurrection. I am life eternal. Beyond this you never can go in religious teaching or religious unfoldment. Beyond this you can never go in religious living. All one needs to do is to walk up and down this world silently, secretly, sacredly, remembering that I in the midst of me is God. I in the midst of me is my wine. I can go without person, without script, and yet find my way around the world and be fed and housed and clothed because when Elijah was out in the woods, persecuted by his own people, he found himself fed once by a widow, once by ravens, once by cakes being baked on stones right in front of him. How they got there, he never knew. Moses, taking the people across the desert, found manna falling from the sky, water coming from the rocks, a light, a fire by night, a cloud by day. Everything needed was produced only because he knew the secret. I am that I am. Jesus fed the multitudes, he healed the sick, and he did it by knowing I am the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you. Thank you.